tooled leather for his octagonal library. For the farm, he imported livestock, including thoroughbreds, which were trained on one of the first private racetracks west of the Appalachians. Many important people visited here, for example, the Marquis de Lafayette in 1825. So the website for Ashland tells the story way better than I could paraphrase. The symbolic significance of Henry Clay's house had grown for his family and for the public after his death, but Clay had unfortunately left behind the seriously dilapidated mansion. James Clay asked architect Lewinsky to ascertain whether the structure was safe for his family to inhabit. The architect, quote, pronounced it unsafe and, moreover, that it would tumble down of itself in a very few years, unquote. James soon made his decision, quote, under these circumstances, I determined to rebuild, unquote. James wanted to reconcile these opposing realities by building a fresh, improved Ashland Mansion in honor of his father while remaining largely fa faithful to the original. James intended to present Ashland as a lasting public memorial to his father. So this means that, so he tore the house down, but the new Ashland, so the reconstructed Ashland, was built on the existing foundations with the same ma massing. So he didn't change much as far as height scale mass. Lewinsky managed a complex architectural feat by integrating the federal style from what it was the first time around with the newer Italianate and Greek revival characteristics, which is what was popular when it was being rebuilt, combining the basic design of the old house with the fresh characteristics of an Italian villa. Now, just as an aside, I think Lewinsky was able to do this more successfully for Ashland 2.0 than he was for Claremont to Whitehall because he was starting from scratch. Right, yeah. He had the foundations, he had the form, but he was able to do everything from like had nothing to work from. And with Claremont, it was like he had to somehow incorporate that house and it wasn't done well, but <laughs> he wasn't, he couldn't start just from the foundation. So he had this house to work from and then he had to sort of make it, turn it into something else of a newer style and then build this giant addition onto it. And it just didn't, it wasn't really very elegant. So the entire effect of the combination, this is for Ashland, federal Italianate architecture was to, said to have been Odd, but not unpleasant. While Ashland Ashland's symmetrical federal floor plan remained at the heart of the structure, and the rooms assigned for uses corresponded to those in Clay's original house, now the interiors were much more lavishly adorned, because we have evolved to the Victorian period where, you know, heavy, more ornament, what have you. James left the literal Ashland behind for one that he envisioned as a noble and world-class, a home that paid tribute in the most distinguished way possible to his father. Ashland was effectively transformed as a public monument through its style. James spared no expense to create a modern, luxuriously furnished mansion. While Henry Clay, too, had furnished his Ashland with items from France and England, as well as fine American-made goods, James's taste for the most opulent foreign furnishings reveals that the new Ashland was a very different place. So Ashland 2.0 was completed in 1857 prior to the evolution of Claremont to Whitehall, but it is interesting to compare the success architecturally that Lewinsky had with starting from just a foundation to having to take a house that was already there, tack onto it, and apply a style. Right. When I was doing the research for Claremont and Ashland, and I've never been to Kentucky, and I'm really kind of inspired to take an architectural field trip to see some of these places. We can do that. It's not far. And we can do the world's longest yard sale. That sounds like the best thing. <laughs> yeah. Out of that is like yard sale, then architectural yeah. tour. And the Kentucky part is the best in my opinion so, <laughs> coming in august 2020 <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good summer right so back to cash who probably <laughs> did spend time at ashland because he was close to his cousin whitehall was the home of cash until his death which was in 1903 oh yeah but five years prior to that like i said he he did eventually grant dora a divorce and he did provide her alimony. And we know that six days after the divorce was finalized, Dora married Riley Brock, a sawmill worker hmm. who apparently was her childhood sweetheart. He turned out to be a bit of a bounder, though. <laughs> As I like to say. He was drunk a lot, and apparently he did sell off a lot of the furniture that Cash had taken from Whitehall to furnish Dora's house with. 
1899, Dora gave birth to their child, who ended up being her only child, a son that she named Cassius Marcellus Clay Brock. So Dora eventually left Raleigh. She moved back into Whitehall and served as a housekeeper for cash. Oh, oh. In 1903, in July of 1903, Riley Brock was killed while trying to skip between moving train cars. Oh my gosh. Because that's always a good idea. <sighs> Oof. So Dora remained at Whitehall as a companion to Cash until his death several months later at the age of 92. And she was 20. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, they married when she, in 1894, so... Oh, sorry, so so nine years in, later. Yeah. yeah, so 23. Yeah, almost 24. Yeah, 24. No, so it's her. it then. becomes her house? Uh, it does not. Uh, she oh. ended up marrying again in 1904 and then divorced her third husband five years later. And then thinking that the fourth time was a charm, mm-hmm. she married again, but then died at the very young age of 35 oh, of gosh. tuberculosis. Oh, you know? yeah. And so the ends ends the story of Cassius Marcellus Clay and... His, oh, that's it? That's Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> He died in 1903, and that was it. That was it. But, I mean, you said that the house was basically rented out and... Yes. Tenant tenant farmers? It's a really nice house for a tenant farmer. The house went up for auction after his death. Uh, His grandson bought it and rented it to tenant farmers. Okay. So it was occupied by tenant farmers until the mid-60s. Crazy. I wonder, yeah, he was chronically in debt. I wonder if they had to sell it in order to pay off. Well, I'm glad that it's not torn down, and it was restored, and it is still there. Yep, it is now a Kentucky State Historical Site. Mm-hmm. Next time we're in Kentucky, we might have to <laughs> take a trip there. I want to see this portrait yeah. of this woman. That's oh, yeah. Supposedly in the ballroom. and The, the ballerina? Yeah, Mm -hmm. would be very interesting. So that is the end of today's episode, episodes, Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's after Christmas, so... Happy New Year, it'll be 2020 next time you hear from us. Yes, it will, it will indeed. I'm ready. 2020 by the time that you're listening to this. (laughs) Maybe. Considering Caroline is terrible. Happy New Year, we don't have any of those horn things. No, we don't. (laughs) <laughs> so confetti we're throwing confetti right yeah. now and wearing silly hats yes exactly <laughs> and so are our cats <laughs> yep oh shoot now i really want to go buy cat no, i cat do too hats, but yeah hats new year's for hats for cats yeah. mm-hmm. i think that's a brilliant idea <laughs> i'm sure edgar would really appreciate yeah, that he would he would look great he, would. he and fez need matching monocles or one of them needs an ascot and one of them needs a monocle and a top hat Pince He They need the, yeah. Pince yeah. yeah. He'd really Riley love that. Would, Edgar would look good in Ascot. No, Edgar needs a beret. Uh-oh. Well, that would negate his little, he has a little British flag collar. Oh. Yeah. So he, he's got to keep it. That's okay. He's got to keep it British. <laughs> Anywho, that is all for now. And tune in again next time. For possible resolutions. Uh, resolutions. I don't do those. I have goal. I mean, there's things that I would like to achieve. I had my first photography show ever. It just didn't happen until the 12th month of the year. Of the year. But that doesn't matter. But it happened. Right. But I'm not sure that was like a goal. I was just like, oh, yeah. It was kind of something that I always wanted to do that I finally did. Uh, as our good friend Mark Twain once said, New Year's Day Now is the accepted time to make your regular annual good resolutions. Next week, you can begin paving hell with them as usual. He was a very smart man, that Mark Twain. I like it. Yeah. So until next time, check out all of our episodes that are up there. Gosh, I think we're we're cracking 30 almost. Binge binge listen. Yeah, binge listen to all the ones you (laughs) haven't listened to yet. And we will have, I'm sure, some scintillating subject for you next time. We always do. Yeah, we do. So, and uh, if you've got any ideas for us, make sure to shoot us an email. We're at scandalsheetspod at gmail.com. Or comment on Instagram. We're always open to suggestions. Scandalsheets is a production of Side Hustle Media. All episodes are researched, hosted, and produced by Caroline Wilson and Adrian Jacobson. Want more Scandal? Make sure you subscribe on your podcatcher of choice. We are available on most directories, including Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, and CastBox. If social media is your jam, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. 
We post photos and other deets for each episode. Our handle is at Scandal Sheets Pod. Thanks for the support, and until next time, stay scandalous. Thank you.